Hikma History presents the Battle of Angelut in 1260. Included in almost any list of all-time crucial battles, it took place in Palestine at Angelut, or the Spring of Goliath, the place where the biblical character David was believed to have defeated the giant Goliath. In an oddly fitting way, the Mamluk victory over the Mongols was a recreation of that. The battle lines were drawn between the newly established Mamluk dynasty of Egypt and the most dominant force the world had ever seen, the Mongols. Mongolia versus Egypt. Seems like improbable foes, right? Well, in this period, nothing seemed improbable for the Mongols. Genghis Khan's successors had expanded in every direction, stretching from Poland to Vietnam and from Siberia all the way to Palestine. Decimating all that had laid before them, the Mongols' reign of terror was so absolute that historians claim they reduced the human footprint through their numerous massacres and actually contributed to a temporary reduction of global warming. But in 1260, they were to meet a foe that was more like them than they had anticipated. A foe that would go on to shock not only the Mongols, but the entire world. Because they would be the first to decisively stop the divine-like expansion of the Mongol hordes. We are of course speaking of the Mamluks of Egypt. So are you ready to find out about one of the most monumental battles of all time? Before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out to our patrons, especially our newest two additions, Joshua and Ari, and of course our usual ones, Omar, Ibrahim and Farid for sponsoring Hikma History. If you want to contribute to Hikma History, regardless of how much, I'd appreciate it if you could check out the link in the bio to this video to our Patreon account. With that being said, let's get going. So by 1260, the Mongol Empire had effectively been split into four sections. You had the Yuan Dynasty in China and Mongolia, the Chagatai Khanat in Central Asia, the Golden Horde in Russia and Eastern Europe, and the Ilkhanate in Persia and the Middle East. Nevertheless, each Mongol Khan continued a policy of aggressive expansion as if to try to bring Genghis's prophecy of world conquest to fruition. The section of the empire we are concerned with in regards to the Battle of Angelut is the Ilkhanate, which was led by Hulaku, a man who might be familiar to many of you for his destruction of Baghdad and subsequently the Abbasid Khalifat. He was also the man responsible for getting rid of the epic group, the Hashashins. On the eve of the battle, Hulaku's forces controlled much of the Middle East, including Anatolia, Mesopotamia and Syria. The Mongol invasion of the Islamic world had meant that its centre had by default become Cairo. In the decade preceding Ain Jalut, the Mamluks had taken the reins of power away from Salahuddin's Ayyubid descendants and established themselves as the rulers of Egypt. The Mamluks themselves are super fascinating because they were an elite group of warrior slaves from Turkic Central Asia and the Caucasus region. The ruler of the Mamluks was Qutuz, a man who had actually been born in Central Asia before being captured and sold into slavery by the Mongols themselves. What a small world, right? To make this awesome story even stranger, the Crusaders, who were still stubbornly clinging on to their territories on the Levantine coast, played an important role in the battle. They were approached by the Mongols to make an alliance against the Muslims. At the same time, the Mamluks were also trying to woo the Crusaders into an alliance against the Mongols. Finally, the Crusaders decided that the Mongols were the more immediate threat and decided to remain neutral, but they crucially allowed the Mamluks to pass their army across Crusader-controlled territory. The immediate build-up to the battle began when Hulaku sent two envoys to Cairo with a letter. Part of it contained the following message. To Qutuz the Mamluk, who fled to escape our swords. You should think of what happened to other countries and submit to us. You have heard how we have conquered a vast empire and have purified the earth of the disorders that tainted it. We have conquered vast areas, massacring all the people. Whither can you flee? What road will you use to escape us? Our horses are swift, our arrows sharp, our swords like thunderbolts our hearts as hard as the mountains, our soldiers as numerous as the sand. 
Kutuz, knowing that the Mongols believed in a primitive form of diplomatic immunity, sliced the envoys in half and put their severed heads on the gates of Cairo for everyone to see. A similar set of circumstances preceded Cengiz's invasion of the Khwarezmian Empire in the 1220s. So as you can see, Kutuz was in no mood to play games either. Now history would not be the fun and dynamic subject it is if it wasn't for extenuating circumstances, things that are not in our control. And often, history hinges upon opportunistic manoeuvres. The extenuating circumstance in this case was the election of a new Khagan, aka leader of the Mongol Empire. The cracks were already beginning to show in Mongol unity and after the death of Mongei Khan in 1259, civil strife had broken out between Halaku's two other brothers about who the next Khagan should be. As a result of this internecine fighting, Hulaku was forced to move the bulk of his troops away from the Middle East and to the Caucasus region, perhaps to become useful to his older brother Kublai against his little brother Arik. Recently, scholarship has demonstrated that Hulaku moved his troops to the mountainous Caucasus region because it was a Mongol custom to move soldiers to cool places in the summer. But in any case, we are sure that Hulaku left the Middle East to his top general, Ketbuka, and around 20,000 Mongol troops. In Cairo, the Mamluk Sultan Qutuz sensed an opportunity. He gathered an army that was roughly the same size, 20,000 soldiers, rode towards Syria and concocted a strategy with Baybars, who will become crucial later on in our story, so remember the name Baybars. The Mamluks had to follow a very strict game plan. The strategy was a fake retreat. So Qutuz was to hide among the trees in the hills with the majority of the army, whilst Baybars took a small force with him to confront the Mongols head on. But this was not a suicide mission. Rather, it was an attempt to provoke the enemy to chase after them. After riding back and forth several times, Ketbuka, the Mongol general, fell for Baybar's trick and started to chase after the Mamluk. The Mongols gave chase until they found themselves ambushed by Qutuz who was patiently waiting in the hills. Even in this context, the Mongols fought bravely and ferociously, at one point even breaking the left wing of the Mamluk army. At this point, Qutuz is said to have taken his helmet off, given an inspiring speech in which he implored his men to fight in the name of Islam and charged into battle himself. The Mongol resistance was overcome, even resulting in the death of General Ketbuka, until the Mongols finally fled, accepting defeat. Interestingly enough, the Mamluks even used the mitfa, which was a primitive form of a hand cannon so that they could frighten the Mongol horses, but it likely wasn't too big of a factor since the Mongols had been fighting the Chinese, masters of gunpowder for centuries. In the aftermath of the battle, the myth of Mongol invincibility was shattered, hence why Ain Jalut is considered a turning point in history. In addition, the divisions in the Mongol Empire meant that independent states such as the Delhi Sultanate and the Mamluk Sultanate could breathe a little bit. The Mongol menace would continue to be a problem until the beginning of the next century. Hulaku promised revenge, but then a strange thing happened. His cousin Berke, who was the leader of the Golden Horde, had converted to Islam some time before. Berke had watched with horror as his cousin Hulaku tore through strongholds of the Islamic world such as Mesopotamia and Syria. After the Battle of Angelut, he allied himself with the Mamluks against the Ilkhanat and thus Hulaku was never able to avenge Angelut because of his war with Berke's Golden Horde. Qutuz, however, was not able to celebrate his victory for long. Seven weeks after his monumental victory, he was assassinated whilst on a hunting trip. The consensus seems to be that the man responsible was none other than Baybars himself, who may have felt disrespected because Qutuz had promised him control of Aleppo prior to the battle, but seemed to go back on his word and become a little bit hesitant after the battle, likely because Qutuz recognized Baybars as a potential threat to his throne. In any case, Baybars kills him and goes on to become one of the greatest Mamluk Sultans. And now Hikma Musings, 
the part where I discuss possible lessons to be taken away from the video content. I would say there are two main things. Firstly, recognizing and jumping on an opportunity. When Hulaku retreated with most of his troops, Kutuz knew that if he wanted to make something happen, it had to be there and then. The likelihood of Hulaku eventually attacking him seemed almost inevitable. Opportunities are one of those rare ingredients which add a flavor to life and prevents it from becoming a stale experience that is characterized by a simple list of things that you are supposed to do. School, work, marry, 9 to 5, pension, etc. Amidst all of that, we have to train our minds to become perceptive to the little opportunities that are presented to us all the time and make the most of them just like Kutuz did against the Mongols. Secondly, the Battle of Angelut is a clear example of how to learn from your opponents. The fake retreat was a tactic that the Mongols had mastered and displayed on battlefields all across Asia and Europe. I would say nobody in history has done the fake retreat as well as the Mongols did. So for the Mamluks to use it would likely have given them the element of surprise because if you're a Mongol, you won't really expect your opponent to use the thing that you are the best at. But if you're going to fight the Mongols, and I don't recommend you doing so, it goes without saying that you have to be bold and brave. And this the Mamluks were. What's that saying? Destiny favors the bold comes to mind. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure to check out our social media at Hikmah History where we have regular informative posts about awesome monuments, battles, cities and figures in the history of the Islamic world. Until next time, peace.